All right, I'm back. So we're gonna get going with uh, audition. So audition is our next sense. And uh, the audition sense has to do with your ability to hear. You think this is your ear. It's not your ear. This is your pinna. Your pinna, just like the cat's pinna, that can orient those different ways, dogs that can stand up when they're at alert attention, your pinna is just made of a, a bunch of flesh and cartilage. Uh, it can't move though, and it doesn't really help to detect anything uh, barely does it function to orient you to where a sense uh, of, of an audition is coming from. But hearing, or audition, is really the detect, I can't see that, let me try. There we go. Audition is really your ability to detect the compression of air molecules that are being, there we go air molecules that are being vibrated in the environment and then passing in waves of compression and retraction. Compression and retraction. Um, if I hit something like that, you hear a very sharp noise because this is a dense and uh, brittle material. If I hit something like this wood table, you're hearing a different sensation. Those represent different frequencies and different amplitudes of compression of air molecules that are reverberating away from whatever surface that I'm striking to create that noise. All right, let's talk about the next sense. Somata sensory. Somata sensory, sometimes referred to as touch, it doesn't just mean touch because it also includes things like proprioception or your kinesthetic sense of where your body is in space. You see, we have sensory neurons that are in each of our layers of the epidermis. Uh, not the outer layer, but um, they're in, inside the, the part that stays there. Now, your skin's a weird thing. Uh, it sheds every 14 days. I referred to that earlier, that what you're seeing now is actually skin cells that were born uh, as ectodermal stem cells uh, about 14 days ago. That's what the average is across your dermis. Now, the epidermis or the outer layer of the skin uh, dies and then flakes off. That's actually what makes up 90% of dust that you see around the place. So if you're out there dusting around with a little feather duster or whatnot, just that dust is mostly human skin cells. Um, it's kind of gross, but whatever. Everybody sheds skin cells and it's not a big deal. The sensory neurons, however, sit below that epidermal layer in the dermis and they sit there and there's several kinds of them. Um, some of them are called um, Mesner's corpuscles. Others are Capsinian corpuscles. Now, what they detect are different things. There are sensory neurons that detect heat. Uh, the book says hot or cold. There's no such thing as actually cold. There's absence of heat. We perceive it as cold, but there's actually not a thing called cold. There's a thing called heat, uh, but there's not a thing called cold. Um, there's a threshold, there's a, the bottom is absolute zero, no vibrations of those molecules. Um, so hair follicles are uh, things that you guys have experienced. If you, if you pull a hair, you'll notice that it hurts. Reason why is these capsinian corpuscles that sit there in the dermis, they detect vibration. There's uh, some, some sensory neurons in your skin detect, like if you cut your skin, then they would de detect this displacement of those, the cellular layers. People have different thresholds for pain, different tolerances for pain. I am a, I'm a sissy, I'm a little sissy. You know, we, we make fun of girls as being weak, but it turns out that females actually have generally a higher pain tolerance than males do. You can measure this by taking your lunula. So if you don't know what your lunula is, this little arc of band of nerve fibers that you'll see there at the base of your nail, what you might call your cuticle, 
That's called the lunula. It's a band of nerve fibers. Here, let's see if I can make that, that focus on it. There we go. All right, I'll get out of the way. All right, focus. There we go. This is called the lunula. Uh, lunula refers to the arch, and the arch is like a crescent moon. Now, that lunula, if you want to go ahead and, and just squeeze down on that with your other fingernail, just dig into it, put your thumb under it, and just dig in super hard, really hard. That pressure is extremely painful. It sends a deep-seated pressure signal up to our brain about this is hurting and damaging this tissue. Most pain is about you're experiencing damaged tissue. Now, some pain's good pain, some pain's bad pain. Um, chronic pain is probably the worst. The acute levels of pain that we have happen because you have myelinated. Remember, myelination is where those um, those glial cells will, whether they're Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system or oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, wrap their hands around the axons of a nerve and make its transmission much faster. So the sharp pains that we get um, that are intense pains, the acute pains, those are from the myelinated sensory neurons, whereas there are less myelinated neurons that are the deep pains, the sort of pressure pains that hurt so bad. Uh, the chronic pain is like that. Another interesting thing about pain is that it's not just your body's pain, your brain interprets even psychic pain. Many of you have maybe have been stressed lately or overwhelmed. If we look at your brain sensation, it's experiencing pain psychologically the same way that it would be experiencing pain as if I was twisting your arm or hurting you in some, some way like that. Uh, I'm not gonna do that. Don't, I hope I didn't trigger any of you. Don't be triggered. Uh, psychologists actually don't, don't, don't think about that. In fact, when people have fears, things that trigger them, psychologists that love and care for their patients and want them to get better, help their patients to encounter those things that trigger them, uh, and then to develop confidence and competence to overcome those fears, those anxieties, those triggers. Um, don't listen to whoever is in charge of your college's equity division about triggering stuff. It's just a whole bunch of malarkey that has no basis in science, no basis in clinical psychological practices. Pain though, psychically, is real. Now it's only real to the person that's experiencing it. Don't dismiss people's pain, right? Uh, you might think that I'm, I'm dismissing, say, the lived experience sort of thing. Well, I think that's a bunch of poppycock that doesn't work for social policies. It's real for the person that experiences it. It is 100% real for that person. So don't be dismissive of the individual. Do be critical of the idea that it applies. Your lived experience applies to everybody of your category. That's just... But pain psychically is interpreted by your brain the same way that pain physically would be interpreted by your body if you experience that. Not all pain's bad pain. In fact, some pain can stimulate your body into sort of a fight or flight mechanism, which is good. It's healthy. It gets your immune system responding as if there's a threat so that you're prepared for threats when they do, when you do encounter them. So don't think that all pain is bad pain. Uh, you know this, you go to the gym and it hurts to lift weights, right? If you're lifting weights, it's like, oh man, my arm is just, it hurts, right? It, it, it burns there, but it develops the strength. It develops the muscle fibers that become more competent to lift that strain, to, to, to deal with that intense level of resistance. And the same thing's true psychologically. When you train yourself to endure that suffering, you become more competent in the future to deal with more intense levels of psychic suffering. So work out physically and work out psychologically. Develop your competence and develop your confidence and develop your capacity for suffering. That's pain. To the death. No. To the pain. I don't think I'm quite familiar with that phrase. All right, your sense of smell. We have already said that your sense of smell is called your olfactory sense. The olfactory sense basically refers to the idea that you have a chemical sense, and that's an ability to detect stimulus that are out in the environment. And those stimulus are chemical odorant molecules. Now, you may have heard a lot of people talk about aerosolized. Aerosolized means that water droplets or liquid droplets are so small that they're gonna break down and they'll even float in the air. 
So if I, achoo, right, and I blew out something, what you would see is that if uh, you, you can watch this on YouTube or all these sort of uh, videos that show you this, if I sneezed, you would see a lot of, you wouldn't see anything, right? You, you would look at me sneezing and nothing comes out of my mouth or my nose. And yet if you watched uh, with a particular scanner for sort of detecting water molecules, you'd see an immense uh, expectoration of, of all these droplets that are coming out of my body. Now, my nose is set up in a very specific way. Now, we're the only primates that have the downward facing nostrils. Isn't that interesting? Um, some people have suggested, evolutionary biologists and psychologists have suggested that we developed our nose uh, in order for us to be able to swim, I took my kids to swim lessons on Monday and uh, it's really interesting that they don't know it, but as soon as they get some time in the water, they realize that if they keep their face at a certain position, they can keep water from going up their nose and then invading uh, their airway uh, so that we can spend more time in water. We're the, the aquatic primates, if you will. And our nose is developed not just for smelling things, but also to enable us to explore uh, other um, environments. But those nasal cavities, that, those nostrils, you see those nostrils, they, whoop, they lead up into uh, your nasal cavity. And your nasal cavity has these sinuses, or these spaces inside of it, um, that are lined with olfactory epithelium. Now, I can't spell. I, I can spell things like olfactory just because I've seen it enough. I can't spell F. I can't, I can, I'm terrible at spelling. I'm not going to write epithelium. Look it up. Epithelium really refers to skin cells, and those skin cells that are in your olfactory epithelium are specific, are specific type of very uh, thin skin cells that allow for these sensory neurons to dip down. Now, where are they dipping down from? They're obviously coming from your brain. Your olfactory bulb lays along the base of your brain. If you remember, I showed you that on the uh, brain model that I have, those tiny little ones uh, that, are, that are at the base of the brain. Those are your olfactory bulbs. And those olfactory bulbs have these glomerous. And these glomerous are sort of connections together from a bunch of sensory neurons that then dip down through the cribiform plate. Um, your cribiform plate's a, the base level of your skull. Uh, and, and it leads up to your brain. In fact, some people who have um, a certain type of tumor called um, the supracella cranial pharyngiomas, they, um, they, the neurosurgeons will go through their nasal cavity and then break open the base of the brain because they, they would have to go all the way in, all the way to the base of the brain. You got to get through a bunch of stuff there. So they just go in through this way and get up to uh, the base plate of the brain. Excuse me, I've got, we're back. Um, so we're talking about your nasal cavity and the olfactory epithelium. The olfactory epithelium allows you to have these, uh, more trucks. It allows you to have these sensory neurons to detect odorant molecules. You have like 400 types of sensory neurons that are specifically for detecting different smells, different chemicals. Um, smell is a really interesting phenomenon because uh, it's, it's something that other animals rely on heavily, whereas humans don't rely as much on smell as we, as we often should. And what's going on with that is that our brain is oriented to take in smell information differently than all the other senses. Uh, I know I'm a brain guy, but all other senses that you have are routed through this thing called the thalamus and the thalamus basically, it filters your input. So uh, if you ever take hallucinogens or those like, you know, um, ketamine or uh, LSD or something like that, what it does is it stops uh, your thalamus from regulating how much sensory input you get in. We'll get more into that when we do drugs. Not when we do drugs. When I talk about what drugs do to your brain. But the idea is that the thalamus regulates your sensory input so that your perception's at a certain level. Your olfactory sensation, however, is not regulated by your thalamus. It goes directly in to a part of your brain that has to do with memory and emotion. Your limbic system. The olfactory bulb's part of that limbic system and it tells us sort of uh, things that we don't tend to rely on in modern society. I think if humans trusted their senses a little bit more, especially their sense of olfactory sensation, they might lead uh, safer and healthier lives. Uh, so olfactory sensation, again, is your sense of smell. You have the nasal cavity. 
odorant molecules, things that break apart. So when I'm drinking, here's my, my glass of beer again. When I drink that, the, the liquid part touches my tongue, but the aerosolized part, the part that's sort of those water molecules that are breaking up into air, actually move not only to like my nose, but in the back of your throat, you have something called your nasal pharynx. There's an area where your throat leads back up to the nasal cavity up inside of your nose. And so I'm getting odorant molecules as I drink something up into my nasal cavity that sort of gives me this sense uh, of what, what we see, the perception of flavor. And so that, that's how you smell and taste together to form that sensation of, of flavor. The sense of smell comes out ready to go. And what I mean by that is when these babies are born, what we know about babies when they're born, their senses are a little bit dulled, not their sense of smell. Olfactory sensation is ready to go from the moment they're born. As soon as you clean that nasal pathway out, sometimes doctors stick a little thing up there, <laughs> suck it out because it's all filled with amniotic fluid or snot or mucus or whatever is up in there, vernix too. Now, when a baby is born and they breastfeed right away, within one hour, pediatric psychologists have figured out that babies, I, I don't know who signs up for these experiments, but I, I read them and I'm like, who's, what mothers are gonna sign up? I actually know, because I, I read the methodology part, but <laughs> the detected babies born within one hour after breastfeeding from birth, right? So they breast, they immediately come up on the, to the mother's chest and they breastfeed their, with their mother. Within one hour, they can detect the smell of their mother and they prefer it to other women's breast milk. Now again, that's colostrum, right? So I already, I already talked about that a bit, but they already can distinguish someone, the one they belong to, the one that they came from by their sense of smell. This is another huge thing about olfactory sensation is that it's a base level sort of thing. It's not the higher order cognitive level thinking stuff like, well, uh, he seems like a nice guy and he makes enough money and uh, he, you know, he's got a good family. All those sort of check boxes, but you're like, he didn't, I just, I don't like him. Or, you know, everybody says she's beautiful and uh, she seems like she's a kind person that would be a good partner for life. She's got her stuff together. She's smart. She checks all those boxes, but I just don't feel that connection, that, that connection. Our olfactory sensation is also about attraction. Now, there's some interesting studies that were done by lots of people um, in the, the idea between attraction to people based on smell. And so I'll talk about a couple of those studies now. So one of those studies uh, has to do with what your armpits smell like, really. Um, so what they had is they had a bunch of guys and they had these guys, first of all, they'd take a, a headshot. Okay, and so the headshot's just like, uh, hey, I'm smiling and you know, whatever you, whatever. Uh, you take your headshot, you know, like you're going for an audition in Hollywood or something. And then what they would do is they'd have the guys not shower in the morning and, and not use any, sh uh, like they, they would shower, but they wouldn't use like soap or water or whatever, or soap or um, shampoo, right? So it wouldn't smell like anything particularly. So it was just their sort of body's odor and they would have them wear a white shirt all day long. And then at the end of the day, take off the shirt and then they would put it into like a, a freezer bag, like a, a Ziploc bag. Now, the headshots of those guys and their shirts that they wore were later taken to a group of women and they were shown A, the headshots and the women rated the guys, you know, the traditional sort of superficial scale, one to 10, this guy's an eight, this guy's a four. Um, just a, a, a strange aside for attraction and stuff. <laughs> um, women rate, if, if you take all women's ratings of, of sort of men like on uh, eHarmony or Match.com or those dating or, you know, Tinder or whatever, 80%, uh, um, women rate 80% of men as less than average attractiveness. So women rate 80% of men, so the, almost all guys, 
as less than average attractive, which is hilarious because what a statistical anomaly. What that really means is that there's not something visually they're seeing when they look at that guy, that's not what's attracting them to him. There's something else going on. And what a lot of people miss is this sense of olfactory sensation. Uh, if you don't believe me, maybe you have this experience. Let me give you an example. You're walking down the hall at school, maybe at college, maybe at, maybe at CRC, and you're, you're just walking through the hallway and you just get a waft of your ex's perfume or cologne. And you turn around immediately to look if that's your ex. And at that moment, before you know if your ex is there, you're filled with an emotion. You're filled with this, or this, oh, this rage of oh, that jerk or oh, that potential. You see, our sense of smell and memory is connected deeply in olfactory sensations to um, our attractions. Babies are attracted to their mother's breast milk. And then later, <laughs> another study I'll tell you about. So those same shirts worn by guys, same pictures, uh, women rated those pictures on that superficial scale of zero to 10. And then also the researchers had them open up that bag, open up that Ziploc bag and take a whiff. Now that's all the sensation they got, but they had those women rate the smells on that same scale, zero to 10. And what we found is amazing is that women can smell the level of attraction they see in the camera. They can smell and differentiate guys. These again are heterosexual women who are, who are smelling males. They can say by their nose what their eyes are gonna tell them visually. Now we don't think that, we're very visual creatures. I'll get to vision later in this class, but we're very visual creatures and we rely heavily on that. But this research shows us we have capabilities of smelling the situation. So for protection and for attraction. What do I mean by protection? I, I see some um, helicopters flying over above and it looks like it's cow fire. So it's like the, the fire. Uh, my sense of smell tells me there's no problem here right now. I could be wrong, but my sense of smell is very highly attuned to something burning. Uh, this is something that if it wasn't true, uh, humans wouldn't have survived as much. If we couldn't go, the wind blowing from over there smells like fire. We better go that way. We wouldn't have survived. And so this adaptive sense of smell is also for protection. Many of you have experienced situations where you walked into a room and you thought, I don't feel right here. Something's wrong here. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. I can't name it linguistically. I can't identify what's wrong, but I have to leave. My thought about that is, is that you're probably, you're probably relying on this sense of smell. We know for a fact that people who are stressed exude from, from their limps, from their, from their sweat glands, they exude a, a detectable scent. And I think when people see that in a context, they probably don't know the experience of this is the smell of someone who's stressed. This is the smell of someone who's on edge. This is the smell of someone who's dangerous but their ancient, developed, created or evolved brain knows that and says, this is a dangerous situation, get out. So, sense of smell or olfactory sensation is extremely important for our attractions and for our safety. So that's like short-term danger, long-term, you know, reproductive fitness. The thing is that you don't actually dislike people's smells. You want to smell people, but we wear those things to cover over our smells, to hide them. To, it's like a farce. It's like when women apply makeup, they're applying makeup in a way to make themselves appear youthful and vibrant and reproductively receptive, right? Sort of the, the flush nature of putting blush on or, or, or the reddened lipsticks is really just showing vasodilation. It's mimicking that. And we put these smells on in the same way uh, to attract people to us. Uh, ladies, by the way, number one rated smell by heterosexual men in the entire world? Vanilla. That's it, vanilla. So there you go. Guys aren't that picky, so 
uh, go with something vanilla. And then, ladies, uh, guys tend to, to smell bad, and, and ladies don't like the bad smell of BO or the body odor of men, so really what they would prefer is a man who's clean. And this is what I tell young guys. Uh, I used to talk to elementary school students who are sort of in that stage of, of about to hit puberty, and what I would tell them is two things you need is to be clean and to be kind. To be clean means that you're healthy and that you've cared for your hygiene, that you've, you've washed yourself daily, that you've thought about your presentation to other people. Those are important things. Uh, and the kindness is something we'll talk about later. But that cleanness really is an attractive feature for heterosexual females to males is that, look, this guy's got his stuff together. He can take care of himself, which then lends towards he might be able to take care of me if I needed him, if I was, say, pregnant or I needed help or... Uh, or support or I needed a partner. He's somebody who's reliably uh, consistent with the way that he cares for health. So being uh, a healthy person is detected by this olfactory sense and that's not something that most people are gonna see when we're in this age of internet dating. You can't see if I smell horrible. Ooh, or mm. You don't know that because there's this digital distance. But we didn't evolve or were created to detect those things in a digital age, we, we evolved or were created to make those things relevant to our mate selection. Stringed instruments like this create noise by taking wire, this is metal wire, and then shaking it at a certain frequency. This is a thicker string. This is a thinner string. So they create a different amplitude and frequency depending on how loud you hear something basically is the amplitude though. That's loud. Or this is a softer sound than amplitude is loudness. Frequency is where you hear, what you hear as different notes, right? the low E or the high E. What I mean by frequency and amplitude is all those air molecules, right, aerosolized things, things in the air, our molecules spread very far apart. When you hit something, it reverberates and it compacts those together in cycles, cycles that have waves. So if I have like a, a very high voice, if somebody has a, you know, most females have higher voices than males, they tend to have high frequency. If a woman was talking at the same at same amplitude, it would sound higher. If a man was talking at the same, uh... If a man was talking, it would be lower, and if it was amplified, it would be louder, okay? Um, the frequency is how many peaks and troughs you have in one second called a hertz. Uh, the amplitude has to do with how compact those air molecules get together and then how far they spread apart. The more compact they get, the greater the amplitude will be. The less compact they get, the less the amplitude will be. Okay, so what did we learn today? We learned all about the senses. We learned about olfaction, vision, audition, gustatory and somatosensory. Um, strange things about your senses are that you don't sense everything that there is. For example, right now there's a bunch of UV light, ultraviolet light that's going through me and you don't sense that. When we finally get to vision in a second, you'll realize that there's an entirety of spectrums of stimuli that you don't detect. For example, Mammals like dolphins and bats use echolocation in order to navigate their worlds. Dolphins obviously in low light in water. Bats, uh, when they fly, they are um, crepuscular animals. They fly in dusk and dawn and they tend to not have very good eyesight and hence this phrase blind as a bat. But if you could echolocate like a bat, you'd have no problem navigating whatsoever. So again, every animal specializes its senses for those biologically relevant things, the stimuli that are gonna to signal to that particular organism what is valuable for them and what is not valuable. Now, ultraviolet light 
is it's a helpful thing for humans, but it isn't helpful enough that we adapted that we adapted the ability to see it. Lobsters, on the other hand, very much need to see ultraviolet light. It helps them find their prey. So lobsters can detect ultraviolet light. They can see that. Um, your sense of smell is pretty good. We talked about it for attraction and danger, but it's not for, say, finding your food. Uh, unlike a dog who would use their nose, their whole sense of olfaction to find their food. Each animal's senses are adapted for those specific biological necessities that that animal has. Uh, and you're no different. 